Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Shvius chapter 6, Halacha 1. This is part 5 of the Shir. And we were covering yesterday this really interesting story. This story is also in the Bavli. In the Bavli, it's split into two. And here in the Yershami, they put it together so you get a context of what's being asked. So the way the story goes is like this. So we're trying to figure out where are the borders of Eretz Yisrael and what do we do with this land that has a questionable status. And we're going to be getting that into that today with a piece of land that uh, the Roman government, the king, uh, the Caesar, actually gave over to Rebbe. And it was given over for a 2,000-year period of time. And the question is, okay, well, if non-Jews are giving over a portion of land over to the head of the, you know, the Jews, in this case, Rebbe, is that going to count as now having status for Eretz Yisrael? So we've been covering a lot of different cases. The case that we really covered yesterday was this case of Batsra and this area in Amman and Moab. And the story is going to go like this. So Rabbi Asi in the Bavli, Yasa over here in the Yershami, wants to know if he can go escort his mother over in Batsra. Now, he's going and asking uh, a question. The, guy, the guy's a Cohen, and he's asking Rabbi Yochanan, can I go escort my mother in Batsra? Batsra is definitely not within the Ole Babel territory. And so it looks like the question is coming across like this. It looks like he's saying, can I go get land, um, you know, foreign land to make myself Teme, which is the Rabbanon, but I'm doing a mitzvah. I know I'm not allowed to leave the land unless I'm going out for work or I'm going out for a shidduch or I'm going out to learn Torah, but I'm doing a different mitzvah that's Doraita. I'm actually going and I'm honoring my mother and father. And so that's what it looks like the question is. And in the Bavli, that's what people think the question is. And your Shami is showing that actually the question is far richer and more deep. There's an aspect in the Bavli that is correct. That is that is a part of the question, but really uh, it's it's a much uh, deeper question. There's a lot more points to it. So Rabbi Yochanan says that if it's for Pekuach Nefesh, go ahead. If you're afraid of her danger, her safety, go ahead. And in that way, you sort of take yourself out of it. There's no problem. You can go do that for Pekuach Nefesh, no problem. But he says, if you're doing it uh, not for that reason, then I don't know. I don't know if you can go over there. And Rabbi Asi doesn't like that answer, and he presses even more, and he says, no, 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 no. You got you to gotta, you gotta tell me. You can't just leave me off like that. You got, I need an answer. And he says, look, if you've already resolved, Rabbi Yochanan says, if you've already resolved in your heart that you're going to go, just go. But that's also a deflection. That's not really saying, oh, I've got this like insight or I saw a Barisa and I researched it. And yeah, here's why you can go or here's why you can't go. He's just saying, look, if you've already got it in your head that you're going to go, then just go and come back. But that's not really like an endorsement. And that's not, and it shouldn't be read as an endorsement, and it's not really saying a clarification on the law, because Rabbi Asi would follow what the law is. He says, I don't know. And we know that there's a a story in uh, in Hulin, I believe it's in 68 or 69, page 68, 69, where Rish Lakish goes over there to Batsra, and he sees, hey, these people are eating shviyas produce and, and, you know, they're eating produce that has uh, sanctity from the land. And he says, no, you can't do that. You, you, you know, you have to tithe. You can't do, you know, you can't eat shviyas produce. This, this land has sanctity. Rabbi Asi is really asking the following question. He's really saying, look, this land over here was part of the land that Sihon conquered. Now, Hashem earlier in the Torah, says to Moshe Rabbeinu, don't go and make war with Ammon and Moab, leave them alone, and don't take their land. Okay, that's the, the, 
you know what you know what Hashem says, that's what Hashem says. That's that's eternal. But something happens. Well, Sichon goes. Sichon goes and takes that land. Doesn't take all of Ammon and Moab, but there's two kings there, and he takes this area from these two kings. And now he has the land. And so Moshe Rabbeinu later on goes and takes that land from Sichon, gives it to Reuben, and part of it over to, um, to uh, Menashe. Half of the tribe of Menashe was on the other side of the Jordan as well. So this land goes over to mostly the tribe of Reuben. And really what Rabbi Asi is asking and saying, hey, wait a second. Is this really going to be land that counts like Moshe Rabbeinu taking it? And wait a second. Is it really a case where this land itself is still under the status like before Sihon took it, which means that if the Jews took possession of it, that there's no sanctity of it because they're not allowed to take it? Or is it a case where Sihon cleaned that obligation and that the Jews didn't take it from Moab and Ammon, Sihon did, and the Jews just took it from Sihon? And so in that case, it would be a case where Rabbi Asi is really asking, is this land cleaned from uh, Sichon's conquest or not cleaned from Sichon's conquest on that obligation? And in the case that it is uh, cleaned of that obligation, then what Rabbi Asi is asking, he's really saying, hey, can I go over to this land over here in Batsra and am I going to get land, foreign land Tuma? And if it's part of Eretz Yisrael, he does it because it's part of Moshe Rabbeinu's conquest and there's no problem with it. But if it didn't get cleansed from foreign land to, I'm sorry, if it didn't get cleansed from that original obligation not to take the land from Moab and Ammon, and then even though Sihon took it and Moshe Rabbeinu took it from Sihon, it still has that status of hey, you can't take the land from Moab and Ammon. So even though you got it from someone else, you still can't take it. In which case, that land still has foreign land Tuma. And that's really a question whether this is going to have also Shvia sanctity on that land for produce or not. That is really what Rabbi Asi is asking. It, it looks like he's saying, oh, can I leave the land to go you know, do this other Doraita mitzvah? It's not really what he's asking. What he's really asking is he's asking, what is the status of the borders of Eretz Yisrael? And is this land in Eretz Yisrael? And if I go over there to do this mitzvah mission, am I going to really become teme or not teme? Because if it's part of Eretz Yisrael, there's no foreign land to Tuma. I can go over there. There's no problem. That's really what's being asked. Now, later on, Rabbi Yochanan changes his mind, and he says that uh, there's a, a case of a student who wants to go over and get a job in Batsra. Rish Lakish finds him a job there, and it's a rabbinical job. And they go and they ask Rabbi Yochanan. Now it's assumed in the text that this Cohen is also that this uh, Rabbi in Bavel is also a Cohen. It's assumed from the text. And otherwise, there's not really an, a, a reason why uh, he would be asking Rabbi Yochanan, can I go over to Batsra? So what Rabbi Yochanan responds and says is, he says, look, going to Batsra is like going from Bavel to Bavel. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything for you for foreign land to Tuma. So that's, that's the idea. Now, if that were uh, part of uh, Eretz Yisrael, then if, if he went over there, um, then you know he could he go to the mikvah, and he wouldn't have to worry about foreign land tuma things, and he could start to eat food in a state of tara. That's really what he's asking. So the Gemara comes on to this other strange case, and this is uh, has a lot of uh, agadic elements to it. So Rabbi Huna wanted to allow a certain place named Yavlona in regard to the restrictions of Shvius and Maestros. So, by the way, we're in uh, Art Scroll 47A2. So, over here, 
the Rosh Cirilio saying that Rabbi Huna held that Yavlona was part of Hutzel Arts. And this is going to be this question, what do we do with Yavlona? Rav Huna came to Rabbi Mana, and Rabbi Huna said to him, I give you this paper which permits the restrictions of Shvius and Maestros in Yavlona for you to sign uh, your name in addition to mine, and you will thereby show that you agree with this halachic decision. So, okay. And Rabbi Mana refused to sign it. So the next day, says this Gemara, Rabbi Hia bar Mad Madya met with Rabbi Mana and stood with him. And Rabbi Hia bar Madya told him, you did not, or you did well not to sign, because Rabbi Yona, your father, used to say, Antoninus gave Yavlona to Rebbe for 2,000 years under a sharecropping agreement. So this Rabbi Mana is going to be the son of Rabbi Yona. And this is a much earlier Rabbi Mana. This is not the head of the academy, but Rabbi Yona's Rabbi Yona was the head of the academy, I believe, in uh, Caesarea. So uh, his son uh, was the uh, the gadol of the day, and that's who it is. But this is a much earlier Rabbi Mana. They did not live in the same time period. So this land of Yav Yavlona is going to be interesting because. Uh, Antoninus, so Antoninus was, you know, the, you know, Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, and he was from common era 161 to 180, and he used to come to Judea a lot. He had a very good friendship with Rebbe, and the Bavli says that uh, he, con he converted, but they used to talk about religious and uh, philosophical matters. Actually, you can read the books uh, by uh, Rabbi, I'm sorry, not Rabbi, by Marcus uh, Aurelius uh, Antoninus today. His books uh, still exist. His books are on Stoicism. And if you are a non-Jew, um, the books are not talking about uh, foreign God. They're not talking about uh, these sorts of things. They're not talking about uh, Avodah Zarah. And, uh, you know, they can give a non-Jew a lot of help in how to uh, traverse life if the, the person is not interested in converting to Judaism. So it's really a book on Stoicism, how to make good decisions in your life, uh, how to be virtuous, uh, how to have clear thinking, how to stay away from temptation that will waste your time. Uh, it's, it's, um, I have a lot of friends who've read, uh, his books and they found them to be very helpful even to this day and in this day. And he wrote them really as a, as a way for, uh, the average person to live a productive life. And, uh, it's really written more as a personal philosophy. He's not writing it as a religious book. And so it does not compete with Judaism. It does not undermine Judaism. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you know non-Jews who are interested in personal development and, you know, they're searching and you kind of want to dissuade them from searching and going and stumbling into a religion and they're really not interested in, you know, getting into Judaism, then, you know, Marcus Aurelius's books are, are good for them to read. It's really personal philosophy for um, how to how to deal with the challenges in life, but he he spent a lot of time uh, with Rebbe, and I think that really you know it shows there's a lot of ideas that uh, you could you could see that they may have come from Rebbe in his books. And now this is this is an interesting thing. So we have we have this this case where you know the emperor is giving his friend a piece of land. Now, the Vilna Gon says about this that uh, although that Rebbe was given this land for 2,000 years, it's not to be understood literally, but rather it's really, you know, like really to be understood that it's given forever. And Ale Tamar, the great Yerushalmi commentator that lived in Israel up, you know, in the 60s and 70s, uh, explains that this is based in the statement of Avodah Zarah 9a, 
that the world will last for 6,000 years. And Antoninus and Rebbe lived around 3960, just before the beginning of the last 2,000 years. So this 2,000-year lease is meant to last for the duration of the world. So there's a lot of agotic things about it. Now, um, there's a question, you know, why did Antoninus structure this as giving it as a 2,000-year-long sharecropping agreement as opposed to just giving them the land? And the Ale Tamar, this great scholar, uh, in his work, uh, cites an Acheron who suggests that there was a Roman decree at the time that forbade the transfer of real estate to Jews forever. And so the only way that Antoninus could give him the land as a sharecropper for a long number of years is to write it as a 2,000-year thing. So there was a existing Roman law that you can't transfer land to a Jew that has a forever um, uh, term to it, that, that uh, it has to be just a lease. And then what uh, he did was he just said, okay, no problem. I'm just going to do it as a 2,000-year lease. So that's basically saying, like, look, you have it forever. But there could be a lot of hints because, you know, we we see that there's a there's a RE that's talking about that um, Antoninus was the Tov the Esav, and this is the the fixed version of Esav that uh, is kind of what Esav was supposed to be, and Rebbe is the Gilgul and the reincarnation of his brother Yaakov, and uh, had parts of his soul in him, and also uh, actually. The RE writes that uh, the emperor Antoninus was the Gilgul of uh, the the Gilgul of um, of Esau, but again, it's with parts. He had the parts of him that were good, and so this this is a case where uh, you see a tikkun where where um, he's you know the the Esau uh, is actually trying to fix things with his brother. And so that's how, you know, you should read the lease of Yavlona, where it's the Tov the Esav and a Gilgul trying to make peace with his brother, trying to be good to his brother, trying to rectify things with his brother to fix uh, what happened earlier in the Torah. So, so this is this question, what do we do with this piece of land now, Yavlona, that a non-Jew came and, you know, did this... 2000 year long sharecropping agreement is this land going to get kedusha and is it is it going to be part of Eretz Israel for Tamei and Tahor issues and is it going to be a case where you know you have to worry about Shvius produce there or not so the gemara says that because rabbi yona your father used to say that antoninus gave yavlona to rebbe for 2000 years under sharecropping agreement therefore any Shvius produce grown there may be eaten even after the Buer deadline, and the land itself may not be worked as in the case of the lands in Syria. But unlike Syria, the produce of Yavlona is exempt from Maestros because it is similar to the fields of the non-Jews in Syria. So the idea is that uh, this rabbi is saying that you did well not to sign because you would have permitted that which is prohibited. In other words, you would have you would have permitted Shvius restrictions. So the the worry is that you know what do you do with land that was done and conquered by a Jewish army, but not as a part of a war of necessity. It was part of a a, a voluntary war that was going to be the war that King David did in Syria, where he got land there. Is that land going to, uh, what's the status of that land going to be? So the idea is that if you have a field that's owned by a non-Jew in Syria, this is in the area that's conquered by King David in a voluntary war, it's going to be exempt from Maestros even if all of the workers are Jewish. And the non-owner, non-Jew's ownership of the land is enough in Syria to make sure there's no obligations of Trumos and Maestros. But the sages are more strict on Shvius, and they enacted a prohibition on many of the agricultural work and things like plowing, even in a non-Jewish field. 
And these same rules applied to Rebbe's field in Yavlona. In other words, you can't work it uh, during Shvius, uh, but they are exempt from Maestros. In, 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 other, in a way, Shvius is actually being treated as more strict. So that's what makes it so interesting. So this land, you know, if you grow the produce there, do you have to tithe it? No. But you you uh, you can't do any of the agricultural labor on Shvius. So it's a it's a very strange thing. Now, the issue of a non-Jew's uh, ownership of land inside of Eretz Yisrael proper is that, you know, his ability or lack uh, thereof to, you know, to get rid of the maestro's obligations are going to be disputed in both the Bavli and the Yerushalmi. And the idea is that, you know, what's going to be the status of Trumos and Maestros if a non-Jew owns land in Eretz Yisrael? That's, that's a Malokit. So that's, you know, that's, that's what's interesting. In the case of this war over there in Syria that was voluntary by King David, the idea is that if a non-Jew owns land over there in that part of that land that was conquered, uh, they don't have any obligations of Trumos and Maestros. But that might not necessarily be the case over here in Eretz Yisrael. Now, over there in Syria, if the non-Jew asks the Jew to go plow the field over there in Syria, even though the non-Jew owns it, then the Jew is not allowed to do the Shvius work. And that's what's so interesting about it. So with regards to a non-Jew in Eretz Yisrael, um, if, if it's going to be governed by the laws of Shvius, uh, or not going to be governed by the laws of Shvius, so in the status of a Jewish-owned field that's sold to a non-Jew, uh, that's going to also be an issue. So, you know, there's a there's a there's a big debate about whether a field owned by a non-Jew uh, in Eretz Yisrael is going to be uh, governed by these laws of Shvius, and also whether they can even own it. And this is a debate that goes back between uh, Rabbi Meir and Shimon Bar Yuhai, and it's unclear. Uh, I mean, it's it goes by Shimon Bar Yuhai, but uh, Rabbi Meir has a lot of very good points, and there's also there's also a question about what about the sanctity of the produce that comes out of the land. Uh, so, the idea the idea here is you know why you know so if you have this land in Yavlona. Um, if he had signed this lease, then basically what he would have been saying is he would have been saying that, um, you know, you would have made Shvius restrictions uh, on this land. And right now there are no Shvius uh, restrictions on this land. So the Gemara is going to move on to the next part of the Mishnah. And so I guess to conclude it, uh, Rab, you know, Yavlona, this this sort of weird piece of land that was given over to Rebbe, um, it's it's going to have the status as you know fields for uh, non-Jews in Syria, uh, and it's also going to be exempt from Maestros. But um, what's interesting about it is that uh, you don't have to worry about uh, Shvius. Uh, Shvius over there. You don't have the restrictions of Shvius over there. So in some way, it's actually going to be more lenient than uh, the land that was conquered by King David. It's going to be treated uh, more leniently. And so the Gemara is going to move on to the next part and it's going to say, and whatever borders were conquered, and you know that's going to be by you know the ascending army in Egypt in the time of Yeshua from Ketziv, until the river of Egypt, until Amana. So there's a question about where the Amana Mountains are. This is a part of land that's very, very, very north up in uh, Lebanon. And it's almost up next to the Turkey borders, the modern Turkey borders. And it's right on the coast of the sea. And then the question is, well, what is going to be the status of 
the uh, Nahal Mitzrayim, this river. And so there used to be a wadi there, and it used to extend down around the Gaza area, the south tip of the Gaza area. So the question is, is that going to be the land? Or is it going to be actually the, uh, the one of the tributaries at the Nile River? Or is it going to be an area where it's actually going to be where um, somewhere near where the Suez Canal is? Uh, so, so it's unclear. So the Gemara says that uh, Rav Huna said, this is the meaning of the Mishnah, and whatever borders were conquered by those ascending from Egypt in the time of Yeshua, such as the narrow strip along the Mediterranean coast from Ketziv until the river of Egypt in the southwest of Eretz Yisrael, and all the land from Ketziv until Amana in the north. So the end of the Mishnah is going to define Amana, and Amana is the mountain as the northern border, both inside and outside Eretz Yisrael. And the Gemara is going to uh, fix that border more precisely regarding these mountains. And there's a Brisa that taught that, and you can see this over in uh, in the Tesefeta in Trumos 2.11. It's also in Tesefeta and Chala 2.9. And it said that the end of the Mishnah, this Brisa taught which part of the Amana mountains is within the boundaries of the land of Israel and which part is outside the land of Israel. And it says that all the territories that slope from the peaks of Amana, the Amana mountains inward, that's going to be south toward Eretz Yisrael. is going to be included in the land of Israel. In other words, this mountain area, that's this mountain, that's very, very north in uh, Lebanon, up right next to the right next to the uh, the Turkey border. Basically, what this is saying, everything south from the peak of the Amana mountain, so the very top and down on the side toward Israel is going to be Israel. In other words, Israel gets right up to the top of that mountain. And so it says, in all the territory that slopes from the peak of the Amana Mountains inward, uh, south toward Eretz Yisrael is included in the land of Israel, and all the territory that slopes from the peaks of the mountains outward and away from Eretz Yisrael is outside of the land of Israel. In other words, the northern boundary of Eretz Yisrael runs through the peak of the Amana Mountains. Now, the Gemara is going to... Uh, the Gemara, the Gemara is going to talk about the how far this boundary of Eretz Yisrael is going to go westward, because we're talking about a mountain that's right next to the shore. And the question is, how much water rights do you get? So the Gemara says, regarding the islands in the Mediterranean Sea, you view them as through a cord that stretched over them that extends from the west of the Amana Mountains to the river of Egypt, and all the islands from the cord inward, in other words, east toward Eretz Yisrael, belong to the territory of the land of Israel. So there are six small islands close to the shore in Ketziv, and a number of small islands opposite uh, Zikron Yaakov, and a salt island near Alit. This is in Haifa. And... Although the Bryce is mentioning only islands, the sea itself that lies to the east of the line is also part of Eretz Israel. So the Bryce is going to specify islands merely because of uh, produce uh, to which laws of Maestros and Shvias can apply if you grew something on those islands. So there's going to be a dissenting view about that. And Rabbi Yudah says, all the sea that is opposite and due west of the coast of the land of Israel is considered the land of Israel. For it is said, as for the western border, the great sea shall be for you as the border, and a border, this shall be for you the western border. And so apparently this extra term, and a border, this, by the way, is in Numbers 34, 6, and they're pointing out that there's an extra term border in there. Okay, and a border is in there. So I'm going to read it again. It says, For as for the western border, a great sea shall be for you as the border, or and a border, this shall be for you the western border. So what do you do with this extra border that's put in there? And this is, according to Rabbi Yudah, really teaching that Eretz Yisrael is going to go westwards as far as the Atlantic Ocean. 
and the idea is that you know it's gonna it's gonna go right from Israel's coastline all the way over to the Atlantic. So the regarding the Mediterranean islands at the sides, this is going to be the north and the south of Eretz Israel's coastline. Uh, he says, you view them as through a cord that's stretched over them and extends from Kifloria. Kifloria is a town that's at the peak of the Amana Mountains, and that's going to mark the northern border of Eretz Israel. You can see that Rashi refers to that as well in Gitin. And the Mara Fulda is saying that Kiflaria is situated in the western extremity of the mountains. And uh, just as there are several opinions of ex exactly where the amount of mountains are, so too there are also some opinions about where Kiflaria is. So he says, you view them as through a cord stretch over them that extends from Kiflaria due west to the Atlantic Ocean. Also, there's a dispute between um, Tosfot and Rashi on exactly where Kiflaria is. And you have a second cord that stretched over them that extends from the river of Egypt due west to the Atlantic Ocean. And the, uh, the idea here is that uh, the question is going to be, you know, where, where is this river of Egypt? What is this river of Egypt? So the Gemara says that, and all the islands from each cord inward between one cord and the other cord belong to the territory of the land of Israel. And all the islands from each cord outward, in other words, away from that cord and outward, are outside of the land of Israel. So this applies only to the islands. So if you have any kind of land mass that falls between the two parts, it's not part of Eretz Israel. So the Gemara is going to conclude with a teaching that's pretty agotic about talking about Amana, and Rabbi Yusta Bar Shinuim said, in the future to come, when the exiles returning to Egypt reach the mountains of Amana, they are destined to utter the song, and what is to utter song, and what is the source? It says, with me from Lebanon, O bride, with me from Lebanon you shall come, you shall sing from the peak of Amana. And this is from Shira Shirim 4.8. And we need the help from uh, the Yafe Mara to explain what this even means. The Yafe Mara says that they will wait to sing until they are just inside the border of Israel. And at that point, the redemption will have already begun and a foreign land will not be an appropriate venue for such a joyful song. So according to Rashi, according to the Yafei Marah, to this verse, it indicates that they will sing when they are in sight within the border of Eretz Yisrael and close to the air, yet still outside the border. The Belzer Rebbe, uh, who is citing uh, Likutim to a Midrash Rabbah in Shemos Rabbah 23.5, is saying that the Jews returning from the diaspora will stop right before the border and recall the dark and bitter moments of the exile for which they continued to serve Hashem amid pure faith. And Amana, says the Belzarebi, says faith. And the Belzarebi says that they will realize that they are going to a place, that's Eretz Yisrael, where Hashem's uh, benevolent countenance will be seen openly, and this will be reluctant to give up and they will be reluctant to give up their former uh, exalted service of Hashem, and this will prompt them to sing a song of flawless faith that would withstood the darkest days of exile before the, they, in fact, entered the land. And that's a beautiful idea. And, you know, uh, Shvius is filled with many, many agadas that are talking about um, things just before the Mashiach comes and things just after the Mashiach comes and these very early days of the temple having just been rebuilt. So this is going to be one of these uh, early uh, signs just before the, the total redemption happens when the Jews are 
in the process of coming back and they're going to look back at the darkest days and they held their faith in their Judaism even though the days were very rough and tough and they kept doing the mitzvahs and they kept believing and Hashem came and delivered them and everything that the Torah says uh, will be manifest right in their faces. It will be obvious to them and it will be obvious that uh, you know, the third temple and the Mashiach, you know, will will be there and, and, you know, be doing this stuff. And, you know, everything that the sages said uh, and, and that the Torah says will uh, actually happen and they will be able to witness that. And so it's going to be uh, amazing for this group of people who withstood the darkest days back when, you know, we had Christians in Asav, you know, Christians are Asav, uh, you know, murdering Jews and with the anti-Semitism that they did and putting Jews into ovens and all of the nastiness that the Christians and Christianity did to Jews with torture and forced conversion and discrimination and um, all of the abuse that they did uh, to Jews in the education system to uh, to demean them as a way to convert them to their Avodah as a way to, you know, trick them into, you know, working for, you know, building up the empire of Esau, which in this case is going to be America and capitalism and taking, you know, the talents of Yaakov and instead of, you know, talking them into learning Torah and, you know, doing Torah, talking them into becoming, you know, venture capitalists and lawyers and talking them into doing everything other than studying Torah and the Gemara. And, you know, what's in a book, you know, when the Christians came and many times in, in Jewish history, what did they do? They came and they burned the Gemaras. And, you know, in, in earlier days, they would come and they would, you know, many many towns, they would burn Gemaras, like in Venice, like in Paris, uh, like in Spain. And they would, they would, uh, they would try to cut up the Gemaras and re-edit them, like what the Russian government did. And over in Lithuania with censorship. And they're afraid of this book. They're afraid of this book. They're afraid of the Gemaras. And they're afraid of the truth of what, what the, the oral law is. And today you have a case where they're not burning the books. They're just, you know, doing everything they can do to convince you, the Jew, not to study a Gemara. And that's also part of the darkest days of living under the exile of Esau. And, you know, all of the confusion that they do when they send you to an Ivy League school and they educate you that the highest end is material gain. And that's the highest spiritual thing that you can do in your life is to gain material. And they talk you into a lifestyle of that. And really, it's going to be the velvet glove of trying to do the same thing that they did before. Instead of burning the books, they're, they're trying to direct you to build up their empire with your talent and and taking the sparks of, of Jewish holiness and, and brain power and talent and using it to build up the, the, the emperor, the empire of Esau. And instead of going and going and learning Gemara, going and learning the way of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And ultimately, the Jews will make an ingathering and there will be a Mashiach as described in Ezekiel 42 and 43, which when you look at the rebuilding of the temple and you look at this prince coming and having to give a sin offering, you'll see it as a complete disproof to Christianity. And everything that the prophet Ovadia says is going to be with regards to Esau and the final end of Christianity. Have a great day.